Hi, I'm Dan Twining. Uh, delighted to have so many friends, colleagues, associates with us today uh, for what I think will be a, a really uh, excellent conversation. I know it will be an excellent conversation because it's an excellent book with our IRI board member, General H.R. McMaster, who uh, is so distinguished that he needs very little introduction, but let me just do that uh, very quickly for you. Uh, General McMaster uh, is on the board of the International Republican Institute. Uh, by day, he is the Fuad and Michelle Ajami Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution and the Japan Chair at the Hudson Institute. He was the 26th Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs, as you know, where he led the creation of President Trump's National Security Strategy released in late 2017. He served as a commissioned officer in the US Army for 34 years before retiring as a Lieutenant General in June, 2018. From 2014 to 2017, General McMaster designed the Future Army as the Director of the Army Capabilities Integration Center and the Deputy Commanding General of the US Army Training and Doctrine Command. Uh, he has extensive command experience in uh, Afghanistan, in Iraq, uh, as well as in Desert Storm in 1990, 1991. In addition to the book we will be discussing today, he wrote the award-winning book, Dereliction of Duty, Lyndon Johnson, Robert McNamara, The Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Lies That Led to Vietnam. Uh, that book uh, appears in cameo form uh, in a couple segments of his new book. Uh, I'm really pleased to welcome you all today. We're honored to be hosting General McMaster. His latest book is Battlegrounds, The Fight to Defend the Free World. And uh, as you will see, General McMaster, for more than his three decades of national security leadership, has seen up close the connection between American interests and political freedom worldwide. The national security strategy uh, that he conceptualized and led uh, during the 2017 period posited a bold vision for countering and confronting, key, confronting geopolitical challengers in this new era of great power competition that he has done so much to define and help us all understand. Uh, in this book, Battlegrounds, he argues for the necessity of America's continued leadership as defender of the free world and makes us think hard and smartly uh, about really fundamentally reassessing our approach to threats ranging from state sponsors of terrorism uh, to uh, emerging techno-authoritarian great power competitors. So General McMaster, we're gonna hear from you for just a couple minutes with broad framing remarks. We're then gonna have a moderated discussion, which I'm very much looking forward to. And then we'll open it up to uh, conversation with the audience. Uh, my last technical note is that the event is being live streamed on Facebook Live on IRI's Facebook page. We will not be taking questions from Facebook. If you wish to submit a question, you may do so by privately messaging the account called Q&A in the Zoom chat. And we're gonna wrap this up uh, just before noon because General McMaster has a tight schedule. Uh, sir, over to you, please. Thank you for being with us. Hey Dan, thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you. And, and thanks especially for the great work that IRI is doing as I think the, the story in Battlegrounds makes clear, the work of IRI is more important to, to our security and I think to, to all humanity uh, the, the, than it has ever been. And, and the, the reason for that is, is that we are engaged in a competition between authoritarian and closed systems and our free and open societies. And, and that competition is intensifying, especially as China is becoming more and more aggressive at exporting its authoritarian mercantilist model uh, and, and if China succeeds, I think it's, it's quite clear to all of us now, the world will be less free, less prosperous, and, and less safe. And so by way of introduction, I thought I might just focus on, on one of the chapters. It's the chapter in which I make recommendations about how we can compete more effective, effectively with the, the policies of the Chinese Communist Party. And the title of that chapter is, is Turning Weakness into Strength. And the idea is that we should take what we see that the, that the Communist Party, Chinese Communist Party fears and sees as, 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 as a source of weakness inside of China and turn that into, turn those elements of, of our society uh, into our greatest strength. So, so what does the Chinese Communist Party fear? Well, first of all, they fear fundamentally that the Chinese people might want to have a say in how they're governed. And so it, strengthening democratic processes and, and institutions it is immensely important work, and that's exactly what IRI does every day. 
what the party fears is, is rule of law, because rule of law would mean that the party doesn't reign supreme over everything, and they can't put a mil over a million people in concentration camps. They can't establish a, a uh, an Orwellian surveillance-based uh, uh, um, police state that extinguishes human freedom and polices the thoughts uh, of their people and makes sure that they have access only to information that the party deems uh, deems is is, uh, is consistent uh, with the party's objectives. They can't certainly have in, in that in that connection uh, freedom of speech or, or freedom of expression. So strengthening authoritative sources of information and fostering programs that develop investigative reporters who can help make governments more accountable uh, to their people. So I, I think that th these are important themes uh, uh, in, in the book that cut across multiple competitions, but I think they're particularly relevant to the competition with the, the Chinese Communist Party. So Dan, I, th I think I'll just stop there and I'm really anxious to see where you'd like to take the conversation. Thanks, sorry. Um, thanks, General, great. Um, so I wanna spend some time on China for sure. Uh, let me just uh, come back to kind of where you start in the book. Uh, and this feeds directly into the competition with China that is underway today. Um, you talk about strategic narcissism, uh, that in fact, uh, a flaw of American grand strategy historically has been uh, the assumption on our side that the future course of world events depends primarily on us, our actions, our policies, our degrees of engagement, that we have not kind of given agency to other countries. Um, you also argue uh, that uh, in fact, uh, uh, both realists on kind of the uh, amoral uh, side of uh, analysis, as well as kind of the new left, uh, both in different ways see American leadership in the world in fundamentally sometimes as part of the problem that if only we did not intercede, uh, if only we had not done this or that with this country, that somehow things would have worked out fine. And that this is actually kind of the pinnacle of narcissism to assume that these events uh, rely on our initiative. Could I just draw you out on that a little bit? Because it's really profound. Well, well th thanks, Dan. I, I define strategic narcissism as, as you alluded to as, as our tendency to define the world only in relation to us. And of course, problem with that is it's self-referential. It does not grant authorship over the future to anyone else except us. And we assume, therefore, that our decisions, whether it's it's decisions to act or decisions to, to disengage, will be decisive to accomplishing a, a, fa a favorable outcome. But of course, the future course of events depends on the actions and initiatives of others, especially rivals, adversaries, and, and enemies. And, and, uh, and it's because of this narcissistic approach to, to the war that I think we've been profoundly disappointed in our foreign policy. And I think the problem became particularly acute at the end of the Cold War. And you know, there was reason for optimism at, at the end of the Cold War. In fact, I tell the story in, in Battlegrounds at, at, of personally witnessing the end of the Cold War as we were patrolling the, the East uh, German, West German border near the, near, near the town of, of Coburg which by the way, it was where Martin Luther translated the Bible into German. And it's also Hans Morgenthau's birthplace, uh, who, I, you know, who I borrowed and then really, and then, and then repurposed the term uh, strategic uh, narcissism. And, and you know, from one moment, we're staring down East German border guards in November of, 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 uh, uh, of 1989. And then in the next moment, there are tens and then hundreds and then thousands and then tens of thousands of East Germans pouring across the border with bouquets of flowers and bottles of wine. There were hugs and tears of joy. And so we, we, the East German government faded away, the Soviet Union collapsed. And, and as I mentioned, there, there's reason for confidence. And then shortly following that was the, the lopsided uh, victory over the fourth largest army in the world uh, in Desert Storm. And it was during this period of time in the 1990s that I think large numbers of, of us bought into three overlapping assumptions about the nature of the post-Cold War world. And foremost among these was that there was an arc of history that had guaranteed the primacy of our free and open societies over closed authoritarian systems. Related to that was the assumption that great power competition was a relic of the past. And then because I think mainly of Desert Storm, there's a belief that our technological military prowess had delivered, remember the, the language of the 90s, the defense language, full spectrum dominance, right? If any 
if any foe had the temerity to challenge the United States militarily, that war would be waged quickly, decisively, efficiently, and mainly you know, from, from standoff range. And, and what I describe in the book is, is that this was a setup. It was a, it was a setup for profound disappointments in the 2000s, starting with, with, with the, the shock of the mass murder attacks of September 11th, 2001, the, the most devastating terrorist attacks in, in history where uh, Al-Qaeda bypassed our vast uh, military advantages you know, with box cutters and, and, and airplanes. And then, and then following that, the unanticipated length and difficulty of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. I, I, I note in the book that we often want to debate, should we have invaded Iraq in 2003? I think what we ought to debate even more than that is who the heck thought it would be easy and why did they think it, it would be easy? And then, and then of course, we have the financial crisis 2008, 2009, and all of this had the effect of shaking our confidence, shaking our confidence in our ability to implement a, a long-term sound approach to foreign policy and, and to shape, uh, shape a, a better world for, few, for generations to come. And, and this is when I, I think we, th that emotional impetus shifted from over-optimism to pessimism. And, and I think it's a fair criticism to say that in, in the 90s and, and the early 2000s, we undervalued, underappreciated the risks and costs of inaction. But I would say after 2008, 2009, we undervalued the risks and costs of disengagement or inaction. Examples I think of, of disengagement include December 2011 in Iraq, uh, when Vice President Biden calls up President Obama and says, hey, thank you for allowing me to end you know, this GD war, right? And then you have, you have, um, you also have, I think as an example, uh, the unenforced red line in, in, in Syria in, in 2014. Uh, you, have, you have also, I think, the example of Libya, uh, in which we, you know, we engaged with the, you know, the bombs not boots approach, uh, and and did really nothing to uh, to shape the the political outcome uh, in Libya. And look at the situation today. So I, I think that that it's paradoxical that that the Obama administration, in endeavoring to avoid what it perceives as the as the as the greatest mistakes of the George W. Bush administration, exceeded those mistakes in many ways uh, in, in, in Libya, for example. So what the book is an argument for is, hey, how about something in between this? How about recognizing the degree to which we do have influence over the future of course of events, but also recognize the limitations by, uh, by emphasizing at first and, and foremost, uh, this, uh, this idea of strategic empathy, uh, which is a, a, a concept I, I borrowed from the great historian Zachary Shore, who, who, who made this uh, a central theme in a, in a book that he wrote years ago called A Sense of the Enemy. And strategic empathy really begins with an effort to understand what drives and constrains the other, especially the emotions and aspirations and ideology. And when we when we skip that, we, we oftentimes allow implicit and fundamentally flawed assumptions to underpin our policies and, and our strategies. Great. So uh, let's apply strategic empathy and strategic narcissism to the case of China. You argue fundamentally in the book that there had been a broad consensus around accommodating an engagement China, uh, reflecting, in fact, a China that we envisioned to emerge, not the China that actually did emerge. Uh, you, uh, when you took the helm as national security advisor, you uh, undertook what you argue was really the greatest, and I think correctly, really the most profound strategic shift in US foreign policy, at least as relates to great power competition since the end of the Cold War, which was to reorient uh, the US establishment around the China challenge, as well as to engage with tech industry, society writ large, because this is a cross-cutting challenge. Um, just to start on kind of the strategic empathy point with China, uh, you argue quite compellingly, you talk about a visit to the Forbidden City with President Trump and the architecture of power embedded in the uh, seat of the Chinese imperial line and how that architecture actually reflects an extraordinary fear and insecurity of uh, both palace intrigue, corruption, as well as alienation from the people. That part of what motivates the Chinese Communist Party in its current incarnation is not a swaggering sense of overconfidence. It is fundamentally a, a set of acute anxieties. So could I just draw you out a little more on that? Right. Well, th well thanks, thanks, Dan. 
and you know, of course, I'm a student of China. I'm not in any way an expert, and and I had some great experts to learn from. Matt Pottinger, foremost among them, on my on my staff, and uh, and in the writing, the writing of this book, Dan, it was a continuation of my own self education. So, I, I, there's a, there's a recommended reading section in the back, and uh, and and in you know, in that recommended reading section, I I list the books that that I read and and really felt uh, were, were immensely helpful in in my understanding better Chinese history. And its application or or manipulation as it relates to the uh, to the Chinese Communist Party, and, and what struck me about the the tour, the tour, tour in in the hidden city, uh, the Forbidden City, was this you know the the way that the 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 main, the main theme was that hierarchy brings harmony, <laughs> and uh, and and the emphasis on on control and centralized control, and and how the architectural style was was meant to. Uh, was meant to display confidence, profound confidence on on the part of uh, of Chinese leadership, and and it was this historical metaphor that Xi Jinping was using to to really uh, to, to really acquaint uh, Donald Trump, uh, President Trump, uh, and our party uh, with the theme that he had introduced in in the speech, not introduced but but expounded on uh, in October of that year at the, at the Communist Party plenum when he spoke of, of China taking center stage in the world, its rightful place after the so-called uh, century of, of humiliation. But the, the more I thought about, about the Chinese Communist Party and what motivates them and read, read about it, uh, it I, I concluded that they are mainly motivated by fear and it's fear of losing control. And this is why obviously you see the, the party extending and tightening its exclusive grip on power by through a number of draconian measures, whether it's throwing Xi Jinping's most vocal critic in jail for 18 years or rounding up you know, the, the usual suspects in, in Hong Kong and throwing them into, into prison or putting a million and a half people in concentration camps or weaponizing people's social networks against them uh, with the, the system of the social credit score. So I, I, think that, I think that Chinese behavior is easier to understand once you realize how desperate the party is to ensure that that the Chinese people don't get the idea that maybe they should have a say uh, in, in, in how they're governed. This also explains their external behavior and this drive to achieve national rejuvenation. One of the mechanisms for controlling the population is an ideological me mechanism of, of uh, you know, jing a jingoistic nationalist uh, interpretation of, uh, of Chinese history and, and, and this idea of, of rejuvenation, retaking center, center stage uh, in, in the world. And I think one of the greatest dangers we face now is what if the Chinese people are believing uh, this propaganda? What if the People's Liberation Army is believing this, this propaganda? And I think what we've seen in, uh, in the COVID-19 period here is that, is that COVID-19, the associated recession, uh, and, and I, I think that the effect that COVID-19 has had on, on us you know, in, in the West and in free and open societies has convinced China that it is time for them to take advantage of what they always saw as a fleeting window of opportunity to realize their, their dreams. And, and this is why I think you see not only uh, more draconian measures taken internally, the extension of, of the repressive arm of the Chinese Communist Party to Hong Kong, but also why you see the, this aggressive wolf warrior diplomacy, massive cyber attacks against our, uh, against our pharmaceutical companies, and medical research facilities in the midst of the pandemic. Australia, because Australia had the temerity to say, hey, maybe we ought to look into the origins of this, of this virus, uh, really experiencing massive cyber attacks across all sectors. The, the increased uh, aggressiveness in the, in the South China Sea, the, the saber rattling and, and, and aggression aimed at, at uh, Taiwan and the Senkakus in Japan, I mean, and the bludgeoning of Indian soldier death on the Himalayan frontier. I think we're entering a very dangerous period because of this, this combination of the fear, the fear of losing control, and this aspiration, this aspiration to take center stage uh, in the world. It, you know, I think that it, it, it's important to, to watch what the party says and, and what the party says to its own people as well through Chinese media. And the messages now are, look how great Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist leadership is. Look how, how, we, how close we are to realizing our dreams and how effective the party is at, at, and, 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 and they're delivering on the promise to the Chinese people. And the third part of it is look how screwed up the West is, you know, and and uh, and so I, I think this is an increasingly dangerous time. Thank you. Um, so you argue very compellingly that the Chinese are pursuing a strategy of co-option, conceal, coercion, and concealment 
Uh, you argue that this actually has in common with Putin's playbook, uh, the objective of collapsing the free, open, and rules-based order that the United States and our allies established after World War II. Uh, you go on to make the point, and of course I do have an interest in drawing you out here, that uh, in your words, strengthening democratic governance at home and abroad could be the best means of inoculating free and open societies against the CCP's campaign of co-option, concealment, and coercion. Could you say a little more about that? Yes. Okay. So, so what, what China wants to do is, is really co-opt elites, dominate the narrative, and and then and co-opt elites mainly through through the you know through the lure of access to the to the Chinese market with the lure for the U.S. financial sector, for example, of of uh, of, of short-term profits uh, for for certain countries. It's the it's the lure of Chinese investment, Chinese investment that is in large measure designed to set a debt trap uh, for for those countries. And all of this is designed to give the party then coercive power over those entities. So whether it's the National Basketball Association or Marriott, for that matter, they have clearly have coercive power over U.S. companies and international companies broadly. Uh, if it if it's a, if it is if it is a country, uh, this is this is the, the the setting of the debt trap under the One Belt One Road system. What has been effective at, at exposing this, this campaign of co-option and coercion, and then concealing this course of these course of access, just you know, normal business practices, has has been has has been democratic uh, gov governments uh, who respond to calls from their people to reform. So in Ecuador, you know, for for example, uh, the, you know the pre the previous government government uh, allowed China to build a massive dam, a dam that was flawed and, and overly priced. Um, and, 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 and in exchange to, to build this dam that was immediately clogged with silt, immediately started to crack. And the first time it was, it was turned on for, for uh, power generation, blew out the entire power grid, uh, was to, to give up all of their oil exports to China uh, at a discount. This is one of the factors of, uh, of, of ending the, that, that administration. And then, of course, what happened after that democratic process was rule of law and, 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 uh, and, and insulated investigative and adjudicative bodies went after those who, who were, you know, who were responsible for indebting future generations of Ecuadorans and put them in prison and imposed costs on them. The same dynamic occurred in, in, in Sri, Sri Lanka. It, include, it occurred at least for a time in, 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 in Malaysia. Uh, there have been similar movements across small countries in, in Oceania and in Africa. So I, I, I think that you know, it's it, it, you, we have already seen the effectiveness of this combination of democratic processes, rule of law, investigative journalism, encountering uh, encountering uh, China's uh, campaign of of co-option, coercion, and concealment. So, what I write in the book is that hey, if, if promoting democratic governance, uh, it, it's not it, it's not only an intrinsic good from a Kantian perspective, right? <laughs> Treating man as an ends. Uh, but but it's it, but it also in, in connection with with our competition uh, with the Chinese Communist Party, it makes sense from the perspective of just hard nosed John Stuart Mill utilitarianism, right? I mean, it is it is the most effective way for us to compete. Thank you. I do think there's a there's an argument out there. There's a straw man argument which you highlight and take on very directly that somehow this democracy assistance mission of the United States is some kind of crusade. Uh, we're for liberal hegemony, really we should all step back and retrench in various ways, or just be uber realists and focus on great power competition. You argue uh, very convincingly that in fact, we can turn what the Chinese uh, autocratic system sees as weakness into strength, as you alluded earlier. Uh, you say that the free exchange of information and ideas may be the greatest competitive advantage of our societies. Uh, you say that we have competitive advantage in freedom of expression, of assembly, of the press, freedom of religion, freedom from persecution uh, based on religion, race, gender, or sex, the freedom to prosper under a free market system, the rule of law, and the protections that we all enjoy. These are all things quite antithetical to the Chinese model. The Chinese model that you argue is not something uh, only for China, that they in fact are looking to make the world safe for autocracy and export a brand of illiberalism uh, that is not simply defensive, but is very much about tearing down the democratic, free and open world. So um, a little more on turning weakness into strength, please. Right. 
Well, first of all, the, the argument that is often used is that some people are just culturally uh, and some people who put it more coarsely, I think they would even say genetically predisposed toward not wanting a say in how they're governed. And, and, and I, you know, I think this is in some ways, this is bigotry masquerading as cultural sensitivity. And, and, uh, and I think that one of the reasons why China is so obsessed with Taiwan is this drive to, to make China whole again, in Xi Jinping's uh, words, as part of national rejuvenation. But it's because Taiwan is, is a shining example of a successful democracy that disproves that point, right? That, 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 that uh, the Chinese people actually do want to say in, that how, in how they're governed, at least the Chinese people who live in, 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 uh, in, in Taiwan. Uh, certainly, we've seen that in Hong Kong as well. Uh, and, and I'm sure that if we had better visibility, if, if all of our journalists were, or the vast majority of them weren't kicked out of China, uh, there'd be more visibility on what the dynamics are internally to China as, as well. So I, I think that this is important to recognize that it, it's not as if we are you know, arguing or th that we should export our, our form of democracy to those who are unwilling, right? Or to undertake grandiose nation building to transform societies. But what America can do and what other free and open societies can do is help those who want to help themselves, who want to reform, who want their, their, to have a say in how they're, they're governed, who want to live under rule, rule of law and, but not, and not have to go to, you know, not have to go to, to criminal uh, organizations or, or you know, tribal militias for protection and, and, and so forth. So I, I think that you know, this has been set up as, as a straw man. You know, this nation building is a dirty word these days. Uh, but but I think the programs like IRIs, where we you know we we recognize it's it's our local partners who have the lead, and we're only there to support. I think is the, is the best way to compete. The other aspect of this is to do this to do this work in in, a, in multinational fora, especially with like-minded countries. You know, Dan, there's a, as you know, there's a lot more cooperation in this area than than I think anybody realizes on the economic front in particular. Japan has largely taken the lead on, for example, promoting infrastructure investment standards that that prevent China or or make it more difficult uh, for for China to to set the debt trap for vulnerable countries. Uh, there were all sorts of of uh, initiatives in connection with uh, with investigating uh, sustain trying to sustain campaigns of industrial espionage against us. And you know, December 2018, about 12 countries, I think it was, simultaneously indicted APT10, the main hacking organization of, uh, of China uh, and, and imposed sanctions on, on, on that organization and individuals within it. So I, I think multinational cooperation and sharing the burden in this is important. And you mentioned also uh, information and how important the information domain is. There are some very important competitions right here coming up on the horizon in terms of, in terms of data standards and privacy standards having to do with communications and, and the internet. And this is, is it's immensely important, I think, for, for our free and open societies to come together to, to influence the establishment of, of, those, of those standards in, in a way that are favorable, favorable to all humanity. We have been a little bit too fragmented on this uh, these days. I think the US has got to, has to work more closely with the European Union, with Japan, and then try to pull India into this conversation uh, in, in, a, in a meaningful way so that there are multiple systems cropping up that really dis disconnect us from one another. Uh, I know that I, I know that there's deep skepticism uh, as well these days because of the own pro the problems we have in our in our own society, uh, problems that are laid bare. I think in, in large measure by the the triple crises of the the pandemic, you know, the recession following the pandemic, and the social divisions and, and unrest uh, and, and violence that followed uh, the murder of, of George Floyd. There has been there have been you know. Uh, uh, themes uh, throughout the whole election of, of, of doubting, you know, the viability of our democratic process during the election. So there's work to do at home here. I cover that in the, in the conclusion of the book. And, and I, I, I write extensively in the book about improving our strategic competence. And, and but it, I, the theme that emerges at the end of the book is a theme of confidence, the need for us to, to, to build confidence in who we are and, and to rebuild confidence in our dem in our own democratic principles and institutions and processes. This is great. I I, I wanted to seg to both digital and us. So uh, thank you for doing that for me. Uh, just a note to the audience: please do put your questions in the chat because we're about to open it up the chat under Q and A, and I'll come to you in just a couple minutes here. But general, last question for you, and maybe I can merge them. Uh, you do make the point 
that we thought technology was going to make autocracy essentially impossible uh, 20 years ago. We have now seen that in fact it has enabled all forms of authoritarian surveillance, control, uh, police state behavior that is much less physically repressive than the old police states, uh, but that in fact is more malign in many respects in terms of thought control, in terms of suppressing speech and assembly and other things. So you argue that there's only so much the US government can do here, right? When it comes to uh, uh, digital disinformation campaigns emanating from hostile actors abroad, uh, when it comes to going on offense, which you argue we should do in terms of helping get free and open information into closed repressive societies so that citizens there uh, can make up their own mind. But that really this needs to be a broader effort uh, beyond just the US national security establishment. It needs to involve the tech companies. It needs to involve uh, businesses, including uh, US capital that underwrites big Chinese tech companies. Uh, and it needs to involve perhaps most importantly citizens, citizens in the United States who need to be educated and smart about the social media they consume, who need to be able to identify uh, foreign sponsored efforts to divide and polarize us. Um, we're about to have a big election. We don't wanna talk about political pa party politics here, partisan things, but really this is really about the future integrity and unity of our country in this digital era. Uh, what more do we need to do? Well, Dan, I, I'm really concerned about this, as I know many Americans are, and I, I think it's it, it's fair to say that we are better connected to each other electronically than ever before, and more disconnected from each other emotionally and psychologically uh, than we have in at least my memory. And so I, I think one of the first things that we have to do is make a concerted effort to bring Americans together, to bring Americans together to have conversations that are more than you know, 280 characters or wherever it is now on Twitter. Conversations that I think should begin with trying to deepen our understanding of the challenges we face. And this was the purpose behind Battlegrounds was I hope that it's read and discussed so that we can develop a better understanding of the challenges we face as the first step in deciding what we can do about those, those challenges. And I think conversations ought to begin more frequently with what we can agree on before we discuss what we disagree on, because you know we can get a lot done just on the basis of what we what we can what we can agree on, and and I think that that uh, that we have to recognize the you know the pernicious danger associated with social media, and how the avarice of, of these companies combined with the, the the business model right of more advertising money, more advertising money through more clicks and more clicks by presenting their users with more and more extreme information that conf confirms the biases that they already carry with them. Uh, and so I, I think that this is a force for division uh, as, as well as is the, 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 uh, the pseudo media that so is a lot of the, you know, the, these conspiracy theories, you know, the QAnon uh, people on, on one end and then you know, their equivalents on, on the, uh, whatever the other end of the political spectrum is. Uh, it's, uh, some of these groups even defy categorization. Yeah, and then also the fact that we're losing confidence in, in any kind of authoritative sources of information. I think it is a sad state of affairs you know, that if you lean one way uh, politically that you watch one cable news station. If you lean the other way politically, you watch one of two other cable news stations. So I, I think that this is, this is a struggle that, that is affected by the business models within the, the media. I think strategic narcissism is in many ways reinforced by the death of, of, uh, of print journalism <laughs> and, and also the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the no longer really uh, posting foreign correspondence uh, overseas. I mean, when is the last time you saw on a morning cable news station, oh, and now we're going to cut to our correspondent in X country? Like never, right? It's all, it's all people sitting around the table talking to each other or at each other. So it, it is in many ways just a, a symbol of, of, this, of this, this phenomenon of strategic narcissism. So I think we have to break out of it, right? And, and um, I argue that, 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 that the, what is most fundamental is, is an educated population. Right? And you know, the greatest strength of, of a nation is an educated population. And, and an educated population is better able to recognize this information for what, for what it is and efforts to, to manipulate it, sort of force upon any of us an, an orthodoxy. 
a, a better a better educated population recognizes can recognize the you know the the nobility uh, and and the radical idea of our revolution that sovereignty lies with the people and celebrate the unalienable rights uh, it, it enshrined in our Declaration of Independence and and then later in, in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Uh, but at the same time, recognize the, the disappointment that it took us 100 years, almost 100 years, to remove the greatest blight on, on our history of slavery. But then again, celebrate the fact that it, 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 in our most destructive war in our history, we emancipated 4 million fellow Americans. And of course, that didn't automatically equate to, to equal rights uh, you know, under the law, because what happened is the failure of Reconstruction and the rise of Jim Crow and the Ku Klux Klan and then a period of separate but equal but then triumph in, in, the, in the civil rights movement of, of, of dismantling at least the jura segregation and inequality of opportunity. But then we, of course, we need to recognize today, we still have de facto inequality of opportunity. I mean, why is it that, 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 that if you're born in a certain zip code, your chances of availing yourself of the American dream could be greatly d diminished? We shouldn't stand for that. And, and, and I think this, again, this is a, an issue set that is frustrating to many of us because education reform has been on the top of you know, how many people's agenda for many years, but I think it needs to stay at the top. And we have to, again, begin these conversations on what we can, what we can, what we can agree on. But I am concerned that there is in the academy these days, you know, almost a, a curriculum that fosters kind of a, I would say a mild form of, of self-loathing, which leads to moral equivalency in, in, in the world. And and, uh, and, and so I, I think this is, the, this is an effort uh, to, I think, foist on young people, I think in, the, in, ac in academia, in, in, in the academy, uh, but also it, maybe in the secondary and primary education these days, an interpretation of, of, of history uh, that, that, it, that is biased in favor of this, of this particular orthodoxy uh, of the new left, you know, that all of the ills of the world Prior to 1945, were due to colonialism. All the ills of the world after 1945 were due to so-called capitalist imperialism. Us, right? So, uh, I think in many ways we are educating young people uh, to to be strategic narcissists because we blame ourselves even for the most egregious acts of our adversaries these days. And so, I I think that we, what we don't want is a contrived happy view of our history. Uh, we want a critical view of our history. But I think that it's time to reject this orthodoxy that I think is dominant uh, in the academy and in education now. So civics education and, and a real reform effort on how we, we teach our own history, I think is foundational to regaining you know, our strategic confidence. Well said, brilliantly said, thank you. Um, okay, speaking of a highly educated uh, populace, we have a question from Ferdus Intaj, who's a PhD candidate at Louisiana State University. Uh, the post-COVID-19 era may see the rise of authoritarianism, really is seeing uh, a, an upsurge of authoritarianism. What should be the priority of the United States in terms of foreign relations and economic relationships with other countries in the post-pandemic phase? Yeah, well, th thanks for that, that question. I, I think that the first priority ought to be to band together more tightly even with like-minded countries and to recognize that we, that we are all in this together. I mean, the reason I use the, 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 the subtitle, the fight to defend the free world is because really none of these challenges that we're facing are conducive to unilateral so, solutions. And so I, I think tightening the, the, those relationships and, and then coming together with a, with a you know, common agenda, uh, a common agenda that will allow us to compete more effectively and to support those who, who want to reform, uh, who, who want to throw off corrupt authoritarian go government uh, and and uh, and and to to have a say to have a say in in, in how they're governed. So I, I think that's the first step. And then the second, I think the second step is to pull the curtain back on what authoritarianism brings you, right? I mean, so hey, you can you can you can partner together with China, and China will help you put into place a, an authoritarian uh, system, an authoritarian surveillance state. And what you get is you get Zimbabwe. How's that turning out? Or you get Cambodia. How's that working? You know, and so I think I think just showing what happens, right? Look look at the plight of the Cuban people and what they continue to suffer in our hemisphere. Look at Venezuela, right? Who whose main clients are Cuba, Russia, uh, and, and China. That's what you get is you get a failed state, right? And and you and you get 
uh, you know, the really the, the violation of, of the most basic rights of, 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 of the people in, in those in those states. So I think that's the second that's the second phase to pull that back. And then and then and then the third is to is to show the examples of of success. Right. I, you know, I I know that Americans, you know, have you know, have a short not attention span, I guess, not right, but, it, but they expect short term results, even when we're confronting long term problems. And I think this is why you see this move to disengage from Afghanistan as an end in and of itself, right? But I think the reason why we have taken this kind of abhorrent, abhorrent approach to Afghanistan of actually partnering with the Taliban against against the, the Afghan government, I mean, I, I, I can't, I mean, it's really the biggest disappointment for me uh, in, in past years is to see the policy we're pursuing there. But I think the reason there's a drive to disengage is really twofold. First of all, I think the standard that we expected was was too high. I mean, if Afghanistan doesn't need to be Denmark. It just needs it just needs to be Afghanistan. And 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 I think the the second aspect of this is that there really are no you know short term solutions to these long term problems. And I think if we could look at cases like Colombia, where we partnered with strong leaders there uh, over decades. And, and turned around what everybody was predicting was going to be an, it was a failed state. Now, you know, Colombia's not out of the woods, right? I mean, there's still problems in Colombia, but Colombia is a success. South Korea is a, a great example that I, I draw out in, in the book of, you know, a country in 1953 that was ravaged by, you know, by decades of war and brutal occupation, had no natural resources, uh, an undereducated, largely illiterate population, a corrupt government, and a hostile neighbor. I mean, prospects were were pretty dim, you know. And and now South Korea is a is a is a vibrant uh, democracy. It's the fifth largest economy in Asia. So I, I, I could go on about this, but I think that's those are the three steps, right? Partner with like-minded countries, expose what it looks like if you if you buy into the you know, the authoritarian program, and then and then show the the successes uh, that, that 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 we've enjoyed. Uh, you know, free and open societies have enjoyed when we partner with others uh, and and to help, you know, really uh, effective leaders and reform movements in other countries. Excellent, thank you. Well, we're going to cut an IRI uh, advertisement drawing from your remarks here. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more, General. Okay, Emerson Segura asks, picking up on your point about uh, actually building off Colombia, uh, what are the threats from the lack of rule of law in some Latin American countries? And can you connect that to the security uh, issues that presents for the United States? Absolutely. So if you, I mean, if you just take Mexico and Central America as, a, as, a, as an example here, what you see is, is the effect of lawlessness and lawlessness that is actively promoted uh, by these dr drug cartels and organized crime networks. What is, I think, extremely important to, to recognize is that these cartels, these organized crime networks are stakeholders in state weakness because it's the weakness of, of state institutions and functions that give them impunity and freedom of action. And so the greatest threat, as it was, I mean, gosh, this was the case in Sicily in fighting the mafia decades ago. It was the case in, in, uh, in Colombia, right? Look, look how many courageous judges gave their lives in Colombia to reestablish rule, rule of law. And, and police uh, and police force uh, members, and so I think the struggle. This I think the struggle in in Mexico, the struggle in, across Central America is the struggle for rule of law fundamentally, and and what is extremely important is to reform security forces so that they can be inoculated uh, against the, against the pernicious uh, threat of these groups, to these groups' ability to infiltrate them. And to turn them to toward their their purpose. Oftentimes, these uh, the, these security forces are subverted by kind of a pyramid scheme, where where they encourage you know lower level police and 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 leaders to buy in to to a to a profit making scheme. That profit making scheme either either allows them to accept payoffs for protection, or for them to engage in rent seeking behavior. And so what happens is impunity comes down the organization, it's anything but a self-policing organization, and cash flows up to those at the top who are at the head of this, this really essentially a criminalized patronage network. And so breaking that really has to recognize the political dynamics behind it and to recognize that these, that these groups are, are, are strong themselves, they're brutal uh, groups, 
who 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 use violence, you know, uh, routinely. But they get their protection from those that that lay outside those groups, gaining visibility of those networks and going after them with insulated investigative and adjudicative bodies is immensely important. It takes very strong leadership to, to do it. it. Took it took Arebe, you know, in, in Korea, I mean, in uh, Colombia to do it. Um, it, it took a, a series of reformers in, in South Korea to, to break corruption networks there. Uh, but the, you know, the, the powerful profit motive associated with narcotics trafficking combined with the weakness uh, of rule of law uh, in, in Mexico and in, in Central America uh, is, is, a da- is a daunting task, but it's one of the, if we don't work on together, uh, it's just going to keep getting worse, right? I mean, just when you think it's, hey, gosh, it couldn't get worse than it is now, it can. I, I think in, in El Salvador, there's a, there's a ray of hope with a reformist uh, president who deserves support. And, and I think that, that when you have kind of the egregious cases of violence, like we saw recently in Mexico, you see the exposure of, of, of leaders who, who are complicit, like in Mexico, hopefully that generates a higher degree of political will to take it on. I mean, oftentimes we, I'm sorry to go on about this, but I haven't worked on this for a few years, is that, you know, is that we don't see this as fundamentally a problem of political will. Oftentimes leaders are unwilling to take on this problem because they're part of the problem. And, 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 uh, and the political settlement in these countries is sometimes dependent on the leadership allowing for unchecked criminality. Well said, thank you. Okay, um, I was remiss in not raising India in our chat, uh, just because we can't talk about everything, but it's so important. Thank yeah. you to Dr. Venkat from the Wilson Center for uh, bringing it into the conversation. India's role in the Indo-Pacific, as relates to China, but also just more broadly is the world's biggest democracy and the possibilities for partnership. Right. So India figures prominently in, in battlegrounds and as you know, did in the, in the national security strategy in 2017 as well. Our, our relationship with India has been on a very positive trajectory since the administration of, of President George W. Bush, who I did think did some, uh, Secretary Condoleezza Rice and others did some really important groundbreaking work there to take our relationship to the next level. My friend at Hoover, David Mulford, you know, who was our ambassador to India at the time, um, and and so I, I I think that you know Ken Juster, who is our ambassador now, is an amazing <laughs> representative uh, of, of the president and our and our country, and, and so I, I'm I'm really bullish on the relationship with India for a number of reasons. First of all, as you mentioned, it's the world's largest uh, democracy. It's a democracy that works in a strange ways sometimes, but it, but it works, um, and and it's a country that has tremendous opportunities in, in, in front of it, but also some very daunting challenges just because of a small problem in India is really big in scale compared to any to, to, to problems that, that, that we encounter. And so I, I, what I write about in Battlegrounds is that I think that we should invigorate a multinational partnership with countries who already have very close relationships with India to help India accomplish its objectives. And, and its objectives in connection with certainly economic growth, but especially on the interconnected problems of energy, environment, uh, climate change, food security, water security, and health security. All these problems, I think oftentimes, we don't do a good enough job addressing them because we don't recognize the interconnected nature of these problem sets. And then we focus on only one, for example, if you focus only on, on, on food security, you could create great stress uh, in terms of lack of potable water, right? Because as has happened in India, 80% of the water supply goes to, to agriculture and, and about 600,000 Indians are in water distress you know, every, every year. So I, I think that we're working together um, with India because if India can succeed in these areas with combinations of transition away from like coal, uh, fired energy production, for example, to natural gas as a bridge, and then, and then renewables, that that will be a model for the for developing economies across the world, and that's the, where the real problem of uh, the, uh, of of energy of um, of climate change and associated with uh, the energy sector in particular uh, has to be addressed, right? And you know, I, I think that also India can can be a shining example that exposes. China's duplicity. I mean, when you have Xi Jinping promising to be, you know, carbon neutral by by you know 2060, 
when the, the party is building 70 coal-fired plants a year, you know, and, and poisoning the world. So so I, I think that that the partnership is most important. India is, is a really important voice diplomatically as well. I think having India inside of BRICS, inside of, of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization provides a sanity check, you know, on, on, on authoritarian regimes within those same uh, same organizations. And then finally, I think that that partnering with India, as I mentioned already, in, in emerging uh, standards, uh, economic standards, and, and especially standards involving data uh, and, and privacy is, is going to be immensely important. Great. Uh, we're just going to do uh, maximum five more minutes here. So uh, I'm going to ask you if you can, I have two questions, and I'm hoping you can do two brief answers because they're quite different. Uh, the first one is from our colleague, not our colleague, somebody in Tunisia named Fakri Farati. So we're going global here. Uh, Fakri asks about the connection between economic uh, growth and political development, that really with COVID in particular, uh, it is generating political turmoil because of its economic impact including you know, in countries like Tunisia, IRI was there observing their last election. It's a successful democracy story, uh, but still a mixed economic picture, partly because of legacy issues related to the authoritarian period of statism. So uh, how do you see the connection between economics and politics going forward in this new landscape we're looking out at? Yeah, well, I, I think they're obviously completely interconnected. And, and I, would just, I would just say that, and this is again, uh, this is again relevant to IRI's mission. It's it's really the development of institutions that allow economic growth, uh, economic growth to 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 uh, to flourish, and and in particular, it is it's rule of law, right? I mean, businesses won't invest, you know, uh, institutions won't invest uh, in unless unless they believe that investment can can be secure, uh, and so I, I think that what you need is you need obviously an educated populace, you need capital. You need you need uh, you need rule uh, of law, uh, and and you need ideas, right? I ideas that you can you can you can uh, you can tr you can transfer into into economic uh, into economic growth, and uh, countries that are successful are those who establish a strong legal frame framework that is conducive conducive to an investment, and that investors realize that they can uh, that they that, you know that they can uh, you know they they can grow business there without risk. So I, I think that they're absolutely interconnected because without political will, uh, you can't put the rule of law into place and, and the institutions in place uh, that, that allow you to foster investment. Of course, the most corrupt uh, governments are those who, who put up all the barriers to, to investment so they can engage in the rent seeking behaviors. So I think, you know, the World Bank's doing business initiative, uh, I mean, uh, uh, index uh, is immensely helpful in this connection and tracking, you know, where, you know, uh, where are the conditions set to attract investment? Thank you. Okay, just in one minute, General, and then we'll let you go. Um, and I'm sorry I don't have time for more questions. We've had some really good ones. Last one from Monty McCurchie. Anne Applebaum writes in her book, Twilight of Democracy, the pernicious influence of moral equivalency, being a belief system corrosive to matters of national politics as well as matters of international politics. Could you generally just provide your thoughts? I mean, you started us with your point about the academy and the education system and this sort of glass half empty view of American history. Right. But moral equivalency, right. perhaps in the context of international politics. Well, I, I think we see this with Russia, and that's what that's what Anne writes about frequently. And and Putin gets away with with murder, literally, uh, oftentimes because of this moral equivalency. I wish the president would be stronger on it. Uh, and and I think what, what I, descri I describe I uh, describe Putin's uh, Putin strategy. I used alliteration. You might have noticed in the book of of uh, uh, his his strategy is disinformation. Uh, disruption and, and denial, right? So, so he, he denies even the most brazen acts. And when we engage in, in moral equivalency, like, hey, they kill people too, or whatever, you know, language like that, it gives him space he, he doesn't he doesn't deserve, right? So, I, I think that that we ought to gain confidence in, in who we are, that our standards are higher. You know, as as a, a democracy, we have to say in how we're governed. We ought to sell, take time to celebrate that, and to and to you know, I've I've spent a lot of time abroad. In in uh, in countries that that don't have rule of law, and it's it's an ugly picture because what takes over is tribalism. People who are protected under the law, they go to criminal or tribal groups for protection, and that fragments society. 
as these groups vie for for positions of advantage over one another and engage in in oftentimes violent competitions for power resources and, and even survival i mean our our founders recognized the danger of that and and built institutions to protect us against factions which i mean are in many ways now the uh, i think evocative of these you know these or, or, or actually were, were descriptions of, of what we've we've become uh, in terms of the vitriolic uh, political discourse that we're engaged in in today. So I think that that you know, we ought to recognize the, the strengths of our system. We can do that by looking relative to other 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 countries. If we engage in moral relativism, we, we don't recognize how lucky we are. And then also we don't recognize the need that our founders identified at, at the founding of our country, that our democracy uh, must be continuously nurtured, right? So we, we we could become complacent and and not nurture our own democracy as well. Thank you, General. Um, it's an excellent book. We've so enjoyed our time with you today. I hope everybody will pick it up. Uh, we really uh, must say, I find your uh, your strategic perspective really inspiring, even though I wouldn't call you an optimist, but you understand that we need to compete that we have a lot to protect and fight for in terms of our democracy, our freedoms, and uh, the global leadership that we have underwritten and provided here for so many years. So thank you for really laying out a roadmap. I really think your book is about the best in laying out a roadmap for the period ahead in terms of what we need to do. And just to close off with the fact that we're in the middle of a US election, uh, and uh, just to take to point uh, your arguments about really focusing in on what holds us together as a country and the, the great idea that the founders intended, the fact that democracy is always going to be a work in progress, but that we have a lot uh, to stand up for and to fight for and uh, a, a pretty bright future ahead here. So thank you, General. Thanks to everybody uh, who listened in, who are now clicking on Amazon to buy the book, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks, General McMaster. Thank you, Dan. All right, great. Bye, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Take care, everybody.